do today. So this, the, the, um, this homework was probably one of the more, probably the, the, the implementation was probably the most challenging of this homework. There were some like details you need to work out in the hash functions and so forth. The, the next one I'll talk about in a second was, was just posted this afternoon or this morning or something. It's on, it's on doing something clustering. And you'll have to write some code, but you can actually, it's, I kept the size as smaller so you could probably actually do most things by hand um, if you really wanted to. It's probably easier to write code for it. But if, if you get really frustrated, you could do it by hand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so um, but the, the first thing I, I want to mention and spend just a couple minutes on is the, um, the data collection report is due next week, Monday, in class. And so this is uh, an intermediate part of the project, and it's, it's maybe kind of confusing what exactly I'm asking for. So, so each group, I only want one page. I don't want it to be small font one page. I want it to be not too large, so it's easy for me to go through and, and, and give you feedback in um, And so it's, um, the reason I have this data collection for uh, this, this, this part here is because you know often when you're doing data mining with actual data, it's going to take a surprising amount of time to go through and clean up and actually work with your data. Just, um, just, uh, I'm just talking with someone who's who had gotten a great data set, but then there's some part that's corrupted, and so he's to go through and figure out what part is corrupted. If you and try and fix this. If you haven't, if you haven't done this yet, it may take some time to actually get your data in the right format. Um, so, so I want you to do this ahead of time, so you're not doing this, you know, the last minute before your report is due. You should be working on the algorithms and the analysis instead of that. Um, so, in, so, so I just basically want you to tell me some things um, about the data you've collected. How do you obtain it? How large is it? And if, it, if I don't think it's a good fit, I'll try and give you some feedback on this. And uh, then you can go and you know improve it if, if need be. But in the last year, most people had collected sufficient data at this point. Um, so the, the other question that I want to ask you about is kind of what format are you storing the data in, and what sort of processing do you have to do? So the reason for this is you may get the data in some long, in some single um, text file or in some like it, it, some file with a large table, some CSV file. And for whatever you're doing, you may not need all these entries. You want to you, you want to clean this file up. One of the other things you might want to do is kind of transform the data into some sort of abstract representation. So um, this could be stored as a, as a set or kind of sort this data in our standard or represent as a graph or do something else to it. So you may want to represent it in, in some other form. And this will allow you then, when you to after this step, to worry about more of the algorithms and the analysis instead of dealing with the data. So I want you to think about how you're going to actually store data and what components of it um, are what components are, are actually needed, and kind of get rid of the the uh, um, the chaff um, part of the data. And then kind of the the fifth bullet point here, which is really the third part, is I want you to think about how you would simulate this data if you were to try and generate a, a uh, um, synthetic data set. Sometimes it'll be really hard to collect a real data set that's large and you want to demonstrate something about how your algorithm scales. So it's important to understand if you were to generate some sort of data set which is synthetic, then how would you do this so you could scale up your, your experiments if you can't get real data which, uh, um, which matches this. Um, the other important reason to um, um, to think about this is it's important to have a good understanding of the model of your data. What is like? Uh, how do you think this was generated? What process did this come from? And to kind of think through this, and th this will help you make sense of, of of the patterns. If you're looking for for some sort of structure which doesn't match up with the model you think your data came from, you're probably asking the wrong questions. Um, so, so, this is, so, so I just want you to think about this, write just a few comments on how you would do this. Um, so, um, so, so this doesn't, 
I, you know, I, I don't need actual code to this, but if you, if you, if you actually have a way to actually simulate, that's great. Um, but if you, uh, but I, I at least want you to think about this, and it may be useful, especially if your data set is not that large. If you can, um, if if you have a way, if you do have a way to actually simulate or simulate something like it, that'll be great. And we'll talk about. We haven't talked too much about these aspects, but it's, for instance, with the graph data in the last part of the class, we'll talk about some issues of how you try and simulate graph data. And this is kind of actually a big open question. What is the model for a lot of these graph data based on um, data on these social networking sites? And this goes into a lot of, corresponds with the sort of structure you'd expect to find. And we'll talk about some of these issues at, at, um, um, in more detail at that point. Um, Right, so uh, this is due in Monday at the start of class, and if you have any questions about what this, you know, what you need to do for this, more specific, send me email or at office hours tomorrow from um, 11 to noon. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, point out was that the third assignment is now online. Um, it's on clustering. There are again two, um, um, two data sets, and I'll basically just have you run um, hierarchical clustering three different types on one of the data sets. Um, so, um, and then do some of the types for the point assignment, which we talked about last Wednesday. Um, um, you'll run the um, um, Gonzales and the K-means plus plus, and then run <coughs> Lloyd's algorithm, use those as seeds as the Lloyd's algorithm and build on top of that, and kind of see I, we tried to, so Yann and I spent some time to try and generate these data sets to try and illustrate some of the principles that we talked about. So you'll get to explore with those. And then I'll ask you to, to prove this point of why, this is the missing part of why Lloyd's algorithm converges in. There are some hints, so you should, you know, you have to prove something, but I think you should be able to do it even if you don't have background of this with, with these hints. And then you also get to play with some cool properties in um, high dimensional data where you'll generate some some uh, really high dimensional vectors and look at the properties of these versus the L1 versus the L2 norm and kind of see how weird stuff happens in high dimensions. Um, so this is uh, basically it and there's again a bonus question which you don't need to answer to get the full credit. So, um, and if you have any questions about the homework you should uh, uh, mainly direct those to Ian. Um, so, all right, great. Um, so, hey, hopefully this will turn off this time. about clustering and the first step we talked about um, um, was higher um, hierarchical um, on clustering and this was really um, a um, bottom up clustering where you started with everything was a separate cluster and you kind of kept merging these together until you got bigger and bigger clusters. Um, then on Wednesday we talked about um, assignment um, based um, clustering. And um, this was where you kind of found these sets of centers and then you just assigned all the points to the closest center. So you it was it was based on this B function on the set of centers, um, which was the R um, max um, C in, in R of whatever distance we had um, between our info, our, the point in question and the center. And so this mapped every point to the, um, to the closest center, right? Um, and there's a bunch of these. This includes the, the you know, the k-means variation on this, but other ones as well. And so then, 
in the, this will be the last section we do on clustering, although in the social network analysis part we'll talk about something that's related to clustering, but um, this time we'll talk about uh, um, spectral clustering. Um, and this is really a um, top-down clustering. And so what we'll do is the, the basic framework of the algorithm is, um, is again going to be really simple. We're, we're going to start, um, um, start with our input x is going to be all one clustering. Um, so it's going to be all in one cluster. Um, uh, um, and then um, while um, x is not good as um, it's not good as a cluster, what we're going to do is we're going to split x into two parts, x1 and x2, and um, then we're going to recur on x1 and on x2. So then we're going to take these parts and split these further. We're going to keep doing this until each of them is, is good enough as a cluster or we decide some reason that we don't want to split anymore. And so, um, so, um, so again, it, this, this requires this kind of vague statement of, you know, how many, um, at, at what point should we stop doing the splitting, right? And there, there are lots of answers to this, just like in the higher control clustering. There are lots of ways you can try and decide what is the right point to stop split, and um, you, you can, you know, look back to the in the notes on that lecture and see lots of variations, and you can use a lot of the similar variations here, or you, including splitting all the way down to there's one point in each cluster, and then say, well, I didn't really need all those, and kind of, um, kind of walk back up a little bit, um, and so, so in this place instead of. Before, the key was this distance between clusters in the hierarchical, and we need to just find the minimum distance. Here, the key is, is going to be this operation where we are splitting one cluster into, into two clusters. And so this will be the key operation here. Everything else is just kind of the, the template of the algorithm. So what we'll, really, what we'll really talk about today is focus on just how to split one set of data into two sets of data, that where we're, uh, both are, um, are kind of, th these parts are much more individually clustered than, than this one part, and, and I'll explain you know, in more detail what that means. Um, and so instead of splitting into two parts, you could say I want to split into three parts or four parts or ten parts, and there are variations that do all these, and we'll, um, I'll mention something towards the end of the lecture that splits it into four parts instead of two parts, right? But, but in, in general, the simplest version is just split it into two parts. Um, okay, so the, the other thing that we'll talk about today, which is different than we talked about with the hierarchical and the Simon-based clustering, is these were based on these, these data sets where you had these objects and you had like a distance between objects, right? Um, for the spectral, well, this generally operates on data that serves as a graph. And th th there's ways you can generalize it beyond just data as a graph, and I'll we'll talk about that at the end, but we're going to focus on um, data serves as a graph. Um, and so a graph is usually represented as a <coughs> set of vertices and edges. Um, so who's... Um, so who's um, Um, so who's seen graphs before? So who's worked with graphs? And okay. Um, so, but so has, has anyone not seen seen graphs? Yeah. Um, um, okay. Then I'll go through this really quickly. So I, I've, I think yeah. last year not everyone has seen, has seen graphs. Okay. Actually, the third one is is not categorized as a hierarchical crossing. Also, I, as I know, the first one is famous like agglomerative crossing, and this. The third one is famous as a divisive clustering. And both of them 
is kind of higher hi calculus. Um, yeah, so, so actually if you use this procedure, you're going to actually build a hierarchy in the same way uh, as well. Um, I guess the real difference here is that you did a, this was bottom up, yeah, I know. and this one was, is, is going to be top down. That's really really going to be the difference here. Um, yeah, so, so I guess you can get a hierarchy out of this one as well. Um, I guess these were generally called hierarchical agglomerative. Yeah. And the third one, I don't call DV, divisive or divisive clustering. Um, yeah, divisive clustering, where you're, you're separating. Yeah. Um, right, so, um, okay, so let me go through just the definition of the graph quickly, so um, I don't spend too much time on it. You'll have um, some set of, of edges, and I'm going to have an example that I'll use as a running example. Uh, throughout the lecture, so. Um, so we'll have these eight, uh, uh, um, we'll have these eight vertices, and then um, the edges, it's gonna be a set of edges and um, A, B, A, C, um, A, D, and, um, and so if you write, just for, just for uh, refresh your memory, when you have these curly brackets, it means it's a set. You can also, sometimes you write edges with uh, uh, um, the parentheses, and that would mean that there is a specific order to them. So when you have a directed graph, you'd write it as parentheses, it would look like A, B instead. But when you write like this, it means there's not a necessarily an order to it. And, and what we talked about today, we won't um, talk about um, edges uh, um, which have a direction to them. Um, so then, if, if you draw a picture of this, then um, this is going to look uh, something like uh, So each of these edges represents an edge, and so if you want all the edges written out, I've got them in the notes. Um, so this is an um, so this is an example. Of the graph, and so um, and so there's also this other representation of a graph you can do as a matrix. Um, so I, I, I explained this before. I, maybe I explained this earlier in class, but remember you can you can represent it just as um, the graph is as this adjacency matrix, where um, H where um, What you do is you put a one um, only if there's a, an edge between them and otherwise a zero. So let me quickly fill in these ones here. A is this A, B, C, and, and D, and then the rest are all zeros. B is to A and D. C is to A. B is to um, A, let's see, B and C. E is to uh, C, F, and G. So really you can just populate it once. And... Um, yeah, so, so, so often with large graphs especially, is, it, it, is that there can be a lot more, a lot more zeros than ones. In fact, there may be something like 
if there are n nodes, they're going to be something like 10 times n ones, and and the rest are going to be zero. So you you actually don't want to store yeah. all the zeros, but it'll just be kind of helpful to uh, helpful to do this. So let me uh, just fill in the rest of the ones so you can. So f is let's see so it's e uh, h g and uh, h g is E and F and H and uh, H is just F, right? Um, um, so if you have known, so just to point out a couple of properties of this, um, which are kind of useful for thinking about these these matrix representations, is that if you don't have any kind of things that are these self loops where you can have an edge to itself, if you don't have any of these, then this. Um, then this diagonal here is going to be all zeros. And so we'll, we'll just think about graphs that don't have any soft loops today. So that means there's all zeros on this diagonal. Um, so the, the other thing, if, it, if it's um, not directed so that the edges go both ways, then, then it means that this, this matrix is going to be symmetric across um, on these diagonals. So this thing here, if I flip it over the Right. This entry, if I flip it over this diagonal, it's, it's going to be the same value. You can compress the matrix. You have symmetry. Yeah. So if you if you have symmetry and you know that, uh, um, then you compress it and say only store this part of the matrix yeah. if you want to. You only need to store the ones in this part of the matrix, right? So if you're just writing it out as the vertices and the edges, this is going to take, uh, you know, potentially much less space than this matrix. Now the matrix. If it's small, you know these are these are only bits the storage of the entries. Where these you have to actually store the essentially the label, and the label takes more space if you have a lot of them. Um, but but generally for very large things, this will be much more compressed representation. But this matrix representation will be very important for what we do today. We'll be essentially operating on this matrix in order to find in order to find the cluster. Um, so it's. It's kind of an inefficient information, but it's capturing a lot of the structure of the um, of this graph here, and it'll be very important as far as the use in the in, in the for the finding the clusters of, of the graph. Um, so um, so then okay. So after we have a graph, then the next question is, um, what does a good cluster of the graph look like? So how would you even think of clustering a graph, right? Before, with, with a bunch of points or vectors and, or people, right? You, you, it was the notion of clustering people, but I only have one graph. How would I, what's the right way to cluster a graph? Anyone other than James who's, who's seen this spectrum? So, so what is the, you know, what, um, so what would make sense? Separating it into subgraphs that are really well connected. Yeah, so subgraphs. Okay, so what is a subgraph? What is uh, um, how would I define a subgraph? Um, just a collection of nodes and edges that were in the original. Yeah, so good. Okay, so so uh, um, so subgraph is going to be a, a subset of all the vertices and all the edges, right? So so it turns out all we need to define it really is just the subset of the vertices. So so a a a, um, a cluster on a graph, um, so G, um, B, E, is going to be S, uh, which is going to be a subset of the vertices. So if you have the vertices, then you can say, I'm going to look at all the edges which touch at least one of these vertices, which have contain at least one of these vertices. And, and this is how I'm going to keep track of the edges. It's going to be the, the, the vertices that I'm going to care about. Um, so you can think of, you know, if you're thinking of clustering, then these 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 vertices can correspond to, you know, um, uh, the, um, these these can be like people on Facebook, and these are all their the edges represent their friends. So then you're really clustering the people. It's the edges aren't so much um, aren't aren't so much important. The notion of 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 clustering. Um, which 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 edges are together? There are other 
there are some people who have looked at trying to group together similar edges, but that's not what this, this topic will be about. Um, okay, so, so let's say that this subset of, of, of um, vertices, so the set S is going to be E, F, and G. So, um, so the, the, um, one thing to notice, again, is that because my goal here is only going to be to split it, I only need to worry about splitting to two clusters. So if I define one cluster, then by virtue, everything else is in the other cluster. So then I'm, I'm also going to have some other cluster T, which is going to be equal to V, and then this is the set minus of V. So this is everything not in V is in T. Right, so if this is S, then my T cluster is going to be this. So then T would be A, B, C, D, and H. So there, there are ways you can look at multiple clusterings at once, but let's just focus on you have just two clusters uh, of the graph you're, you're comparing. Um, 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 okay, so, so then given a cluster on a graph, what's a good property for, uh, um, for this cluster to have, right? You said it's going to have, um, so the, the, you said it's going to have lots of edges inside of the cluster, right? Um, so, um, so this is what we call the volume of a cluster. Um, um, the volume, or I'm just going to write vol of S, is going to be the number of edges um, that include any point in, in S. So the volume is going to be these edges, internal edges, they're touching the points, but it's also going to be these edges which are coming partway out of the cluster. So this edge is going to count for both, these two edges are going to count for both S and T, whereas these are only going to be in S. Right, so in here, in this example, the, the volume of S is going to be 5. Um, so um, this, uh, so, um, so this, this volume property is one important thing, but if I just wanted a good volume of a cluster, then I could just include, include all, of, all of the vertices, right? Um, so what's the other property? There, there's a, one other important property that you would want in the, in the, in, um, that you want to have in the cluster. Um, the density is kind of like the volume. You want volume divided by the uh, number of uh, vertices. Um, yeah, right. And so you, uh, um, yeah, that's right. So you want it to have a high volume, but if you're just splitting, so if you're just splitting to the graph into two subgraphs, then essentially the number of vertices is fixed in the sum of the two clusters. So kind of the volume is taken care of of the density to some extent already. Um, right, right. So you want, you, you don't want a lot of these edges going across here, right? So, so if you're trying to find clusters of friends on Facebook, you want everyone inside of a cluster to be, to be friends or allow them to be friends and not have too many friends going across the clusters, right? So this would be a, a cohesive group. Um, so then the other property, um, on the one is, um, is going to be called the cut of the cluster. And the, the, the cut of the cluster is the number of, um, of edges um, um, with um, um, one vertex in, in S and one vertex in, in T. So it's it's going to straddle between these two clusters, 
Okay, so this is the cut. Um, so it'd be two. What? So it would be two. So uh, yeah, so the cut here is, is two in this case. Right. And it, if I look at at the cluster T here, now the volume is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the cut is two. Um, yeah, so I want to have both of these properties. I want the volume to be large, there would be a lot of edges, but the cut to be small. And so there's, there's kind of, there's, there's not a completely standard way of, of combining these two things, but the, 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 or at least a very popular variant of a way of combining these is, is called the normalized um, um, it's called the normalized cut, and it's um, so the m cut of st is going to be equal to um, the cut of st over the volume of s plus the cut of st over the, um, the volume of T. <laughs> so what you want is the cut to be small and the volume to be large. So you want the normalized cut um, to be small. The smaller you make either the, the, the cut, then this, this value is going to go down. And the larger you make um, the volumes, then this value is also going to go down because you're dividing it. Right? So you want this value to be small. Right. So is the volume of T? Uh, T was six? seven, I think, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. We got this range thing over here. Yeah. So that's two fifths plus two sevenths. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's let's do that. So the cut is always two, and so in the example, this is two fifths plus two sevenths. Yeah. Right. So if you have a, a good normalized, if the normalized cut is small, or it's the smallest thing in the in the in the graph, then this is probably uh, uh, um, uh, going to be a good. Um, this is probably going to be a good cluster. So we'll mention something. Um, so, um, okay, so is, is the clustering I've drawn of this graph a good one? Or is, is there where you can change this clustering to make the normalized cut smaller? Yeah, H seems like an issue. Yes, yeah, so let's look what happened if we switch this so that S now becomes this and, and T becomes these. All right, so let's see if the normalized cut goes down. This, this H is not connected to anything in this set over here, so why would we put it in the same cluster, right? But it is connected to something here. So let's, let's check this out. Okay, so, so now with the, with the blue clustering, the volume of S is now going to be um, one, two, three, four, five. It's the same as it was before. Of S equal to five. The volume of T is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is going to be six. Um, so the volume of T actually went down. The volume we wanted the volumes large, um, and the this one stayed the same. This one actually went down. So so far we aren't doing. Um, so good. But, cut um, one, right? but if you look at the cut, um, the cut here of ST is now only one, right? So now, if you look at the normalized cut, the um, the end cut of ST is now going to be one fifth plus one sixth. Yeah. Well, the uh, the only cut is this one edge here. There's only one edge between. I used to have this other edge, and now I've, I've gotten rid of this. I've incorporated this into the S cluster. 
Right? So now the normalized has only one fifth plus one sixth, and uh, it would has a. So I've, I've got the answer written down here. This one is 0 0.367. Um, if anyone wants to compute this, let's see, this is 0.4, and this is point, what would this be like, 0.3? Yeah, 0 0.28. 0 0.28, okay, so let's say this is about 0 0.68. Right. Right, so this was 0 0.68, this was, um, and this is almost half the size, right? So this is this way of clustering is, is a much better has a much lower um, normalized cut, and it seems like it's a much nicer cluster, right? These are this is a very cohesive set, this is a cohesive set, and this H, well, it doesn't really fit anywhere, but it's better to fit in this part than in, than in this part here. So you mentioned so this is what we're going to try and find this normalized cut, the Clustering with the smallest normalized cut of a, of a graph. So, um, whether or not we finish right here would just depend on like what kind of uh, normalized cut we find and on like when the cluster is good. Right. Um, yeah, right, right. So, you could have some threshold on normalized cut, or maybe you have a threshold on cluster size. You, you, you don't want anything smaller than, than four, or, or maybe you don't want anything larger than two, so you keep going down. If we, if we had done that, there's no clustering, and then just like gone down or recursion, then we probably would have split, split each away from each other. Yeah, so, so, so probably the next round down, you would definitely split this from here. This is what you would probably do. Um, and maybe you would split this, maybe you wouldn't. Yeah. Um, oh. I'm all right. So, so what we want is this split that has a small normalized cut. So um, how would, um, what's a good way to find a clustering that has a small, uh, uh, has a split that has a small normalized cut? On a, think on a really large graph. So we need a really kind of, kind of a, a, a way of doing this which is very, very principled. Language completely disconnects. Yeah. So if we can find these connected components where there's no, uh, there's nothing connected, then the cut is going to be zero, and the normalized cut is zero. Right. So if it's not connected, then it should be. We should be able to find these connected components. Um, but let's assume our graph is is connected. 